And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple. The double-headed monster that is three that is three hound games. In the red corner, the one and only Jason Chambers. And in the blue corner, the man known as James Be Beneda. I almost, for whatever reason, every time I read that, I almost want to say Brenda, and I don't know why. You wouldn't hey. be the first. I sure hope not. How are you two doing today? We are doing well, sir, and yourself? I am do I am doing good. Um I'm not a f I'm not a fan of the sum of the summer heat, but that but I am but I am one of those weirdos who prefers the win who prefers the winter. Well, I'm I'm right there with you, and it's pretty sad considering I'm living in Florida, but I would say I agree. I prefer the winter cold to the summer heat myself. I will be the outlier. <laughs> I will embrace Florida. <laughs> oh. So, let me start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Jason, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I'm the shorter story. Um, comparatively, I am a newer, uh, in terms of time played, newer gamer for role-playing games. Uh, for me, it I'd always kind of been... Uh, where I knew what D&D &D was, Dungeons & Dragons was, or um, RPGs in general, you know, for video games, uh, but I had never played. D&D yeah, &D was always something on the periphery. Uh, however, uh, after college, one of my, my best friends, he was playing Pathfinder, and he was telling me about their campaign and... You know, oh, this was going on, and my paladin did that, and this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, man, that sounds really cool. Like, what's Pathfinder? He's like, well, it's, it's basically just D&D, &D, but a little different. I'm like, okay, all right, well, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, sounds cool, sounds cool. And then one day, I uh, was watching uh, Geek and Sundry on Twitch, and a new show called Critical Role popped up. And I was like, well, oh, the people, I know who these people are. and Oh, they're playing D&D. &D. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get to see D&D. Watched a few episodes and was like, I gotta try this. I gotta try it. I gotta figure out how to do it. So, went to the uh, Jacksonville Game Forums website. Was just posted, hey, I'm new. I've never played. I'm looking for a group. Uh, please help me out. And a gentleman named James Benedict replied and said, hey, we're uh, we're always you know open to new players. Uh, you know, if you want to come, we can uh, show you the ropes. Cool, sounds great. Couple days beforehand, hey, you never made a character, have you? No, no, can't say I've ever made a character. Well, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Well, I was thinking maybe like a dragonborn who's dual wielding. Okay, well, we're playing GURPS, not Dungeons and Dragons. What's GURPS? Uh, it's similar, but very different. Okay, how about I make the character for you? You know what, Jimmy? That sounds great. I'll I'll let you make the character. Went to my first session, started off playing GURPS, and went, okay, I got it. It's not D and D, but it is. You know, it's still a role playing game. This is a lot of fun. Cool. And kind of things. That was where I first met Jimmy. You know, it's been about five or six years now. And after a little while, he's like, hey, D and D five E's out. Let's go check that out. Okay, let's go check it out. Started playing that. And met up with, you know, who are now my normal gaming people here in Jacksonville. And so for me, I've expanded from there. Played a few other RPGs. Uh, Dragon Age RPG, First Edition Pathfinder. Um, GURPS, D&D, &D, 5e. And also um, Vampire the Masquerade. You know, play that too. Mm-hmm. Oh, so I'm pr I'm guessing I'm guessing you've got a few pounds of D sixes lying around. 
Oh yeah, the uh, the dice collection is uh, vast and yet still growing because I always find something that I'm like, ooh, that's I want that. Let me let me get this set of dice, or you know, I found I, when we go to cons, every once in a while they'll have like you know custom dice. Like I have one that's like a Star Wars dice with a it's a six sided, and that was the only thing they had. And the six is like the hyperspace lines, you know. So I'll find certain things like that that I'm like, oh, that's a cool thing. I need to get that die. Yeah. Um, what about you, James? Uh, well, my first introduction to D and D, I was probably seven or eight, and my hippie aunt handed me a box and said, "You might find this interesting." And when I say the red box D and D, I don't mean the iconic Elmore Dragon D and D. I mean the old school dragon with the female wizard and the uh, warrior with the uh, wooden shield and the sword raised back. Hmm. Uh, and I got through that and I just started yeah, just kind of looking through it. I had no idea what I was looking at or, or, or even what this was. Uh, but I could read a dwarf, I could read an elf, fighter, mage, I got all that. Fast forward a few years. Uh, high school, I uh, really started picking up with uh, AD&D. Mm -hmm. uh, was in the military. Uh, one weekend, picked up a D&D game. This gentleman came in, uh, said he ran a small group, was looking for players. Uh, myself and uh, another guy got picked up to come in and when we met him and his group up until that point I've only ever played D&D &D. Uh, mm -hmm. at that point we got introduced to GURPS Rollmaster Traveler, Paranoia uh, I, I mean you, you name it we played it um, uh, you're not cleared for that citizen are you unhappy with right. your clearance <laughs> that's right <laughs> um it, it, the one thing that he did at his table, which I thought was great, uh, was if you played at his house, at some point you had to run a game at his house. It didn't matter what system. Uh, it, it just, you had to, everyone at the table had to take a turn running. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, and that was a great experience. Uh, now I will say, your, your, your kicking boy GURPS is probably, you know, the system that I grew fond of just because we happened to use it the most. It was to be. I, uh, I don't hate. I don't those. hate. I don't hate GURPS. I just like. I just like giving the cult of. GURPS, I just like giving the cult of GURPS and the and um, the GURPS diehards um, shit. I, I get it, and I'm not saying it's the end all be all. I will never say that. Uh, no, but know, being a fan of being a fan of gaming, I, I enjoy everything, and and everything has its place. I truly believe that. You know. Uh, Right there, but what really drew me in, honestly, what really sucked me into uh, the fantasy genre was not so much the games or the mechanics. Uh, really, it was the truly it was the art of D and D. It was the Godfathers of D and D, right? It was Elmore, Parkinson, uh, Caldwell, uh, and later on Easley. Uh, and on top of that, you know, you had you know Wise and Hickman who had the stories, um, Fred Saberhagen with the with the Book of Swords. Uh, Thieves World, I thought was outstanding. So you're using these, and then you're playing a fantasy game. I mean, I, there was so much to get drawn in from. But even today, even today, to go back and look at um, the artwork, I mean, if you can't get drawn in and get excited about playing in that world, um, I, I don't know what would. Hmm. So that that's what really, really sucked me in was everything on the periphery you know getting the dragon magazine right going to the going to the bookstore and picking up that edition of dragon magazine and let's see what the, let's see what they're doing in there and just to cover work it just it, it was amazing so mm -hmm. that that's really what drew me in uh, more so than uh the game systems uh, themselves yeah now with that in mind um, since you mentioned, since you met, since you had a bit of a you name you name it, I, you name it, I've pl I've played or run it approach. I'd like to pull a bit of a lightning round and see it, and see if you're familiar with any of the 
with any of the names that I throw at you. I'm going to stop you right there. I've heard your stuff. I do not have your breath of knowledge. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to pull out some stuff, man, that I don't know. Maybe three people in the United States have played. <laughs> and 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 you and your buddies are all three of them. And we have no idea what you are. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'll let's take, I play the mainstream ones. How about that? Um, I was get, I was going to use Phoenix Command as a litmus test, but I guess not. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I know where he's going to go with this because you, you it's it, just your other interviews. I've heard it, and I'm like, what? And I'm like looking this up. I'm like, oh my god, I never even heard of that. And then I'll call up one of my friends who has even more experience than I do, and I'm like, hey, have you heard this? And he's like, where'd you hear about this? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, no, nope, oh. no. Nope. Kudos, man. I bow down. I give up. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even. I wasn't even trying to make that into a flex. Oh. Um, I I will say I agree with Jimmy on that. I've I've heard you talk about that kind of thing, and I'm like, man, I know five systems. This guy makes me feel like five is just a drop in the bucket. <laughs> Oh, I, I was one of those weirdos who would go into who would go into bookstores and the like and wouldn't leave until closing, just reading through everything. I, I can do that with books. I've just never done that with RPGs. I never, I didn't have uh, that with me, and I don't know if it was maybe where I was at. I didn't have. I mean, in Richmond, we had one game store, literally one game store, one I Jacks. So, if it wasn't in one eye jacks, you just didn't have it. Oh. Uh, so, we were pretty limited in that. Yeah, just eventually, I would, I'd like to say that I, that I mainly did, I mainly do that with regular books, but I ran out of, I ran out of regular books. <laughs> oh. But, the, truth be, truth be told, I think, one of the names that I wa- that I was going to give weren't going to be weren't going to be th- weren't going to be that level of deep. I say that level of deep cut, but to some, um, even though it was published by TSR, Boot Hill and Star Frontiers count as deep cuts. So, interesting thing about Boot Hill, mm-hmm. uh, that was the first time we ever had a fight break out at a table, like a physical fight break out at a table because. Uh, the guy rolled himself a critical and died, and uh, he took it very personally. So, yeah. oh, so you had a yeah. campaign for North Africa moment? Yes, have yes. You, have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen what the board for that particular board game looks like? I, I have. I've never played it. I've seen the board, but I understand. I think so was it was a Matt Koval that just did his last stretch goal on Kickstarter. And it was something weird, like they were going to play 10 hours of that. Oh. I, I think if they made it, I think they have made it. I don't know if they've actually played it and done it, but yeah, that was going to be, that's part of the stretch goal, because everyone's like, it sits on a desk and no one ever uses it. Oh. There's that infamous picture of somebody, of somebody's kid laying next to the board. You know, just to sh- just to show how freaking huge the thing is. Hmm. But um, I've been I've been in some plays with that thing. Um, that game can cause fights. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say, but most could. This is the first time I've actually seen anybody get th- that upset. Uh, no, I've seen I've seen people I've seen people get into get into fights over um over being over being the la over being the last guy to have to have to pull a, have to pull a block in Jenga, which I maintain that Jenga it could, should be considered a form of torture. I I could see that, but again, I I've never heard of a Jenga game getting I've never personally heard of a Jenga game getting physical. Um, no, these. No, these days, these days, it's it's stuff like Mario Kart that starts the fight. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Got that one right. Or yeah, now you're talking Jason's world. <laughs> or the t- we had a, when when we would all play Goldeneye at at my place, we would have we would have a rule that if you picked odd job, we're all allowed to 
to take to take one to take one round punching you in the balls. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. For for my friend group, it was our uh, job is just off limits. Just no. <laughs> I didn't make him Not off limits. I didn't make him off limits, but because of that penalty, nobody wanted to do it. The it was... the only time you were allowed to pick a job as a character was if it was three v one. That was the only time it was allowed with my friend group hmm. growing up. But with that with that in mind, I'd like to. I'd like to pick your guys' brains about how, about how exactly Mythos came to be. Was it a case of you guys hacking 5th edition and then it just took on a life of its own? I remember this distinctly. And yes, we were homebrewing D&D. Because, &D, uh, um, as you previously mentioned, it's a very pliable system. So I, I am a fan of D&D &D 5e. Let me start there. This isn't a, this isn't a bash. I'm not here to bash uh, D and D, uh, but I started adding to it, and I think it was on a phone call with Jason, uh, where he said, "You know, man, you just might not want to start writing some of this down because we are no longer playing D and D." Uh, I never really thought of it, so I uh, took a pen to paper, and Jason and I. And a couple of other guys uh, sat around and started kind of hammering out and thinking about what we liked, what we didn't like, and not just in D and D, but in in multiple game systems. And what we found was what we found what could work and what didn't. Because um, no matter how much you love a system, you can always find fault. There's always going to be something that frustrates you. Uh, so we kind of looked at that, and then you know through multiple multiple iterations. Um, we have this final product mm -hmm. uh, now. So I, I really, if you want to talk about it, like who did it, was really Jason's idea because I would have never thought to put this to paper because to me it's just it's just homebrew rules. This is something I'm, I've always done. I mean, I I I've always told Jimmy this. I'm like, I appreciate the credit. I I don't think that's a hundred percent true. I I like to think that we both had our hands in the making for the simple fact that he was like, you know, Jimmy was like, hey, we're playing five e, but let's let's try putting in you know active defenses, block dodge parry instead of an AC. Let's see how that works. Oh, let's let's try and put in these damage multipliers, right? See if see if we can make D and D a little less death by a thousand cuts. All right, let's try this, try this. And like he said, you know, got to a point where, and it wasn't just me. I was the one who voiced it, but there were a couple other people that were like, we're not, this doesn't feel like we're playing 5e anymore. This feels like we're playing something else. Mm -hmm. So, and I told him, I said, hey, you know, this is kind of, you know, this is what, what I'm feeling and what some other people are feeling. And, you know, have you ever thought about just maybe trying to write out, you know, write out your own system or write this down, like he said? You know, and it was just something where I was like, I saw where he was going with it, and I was like, I think this could be something good. But I also know that our group, that specific group, we got together to play 5e. And everyone's like, what the heck's going on? We're not playing 5e. We're playing something else. <laughs> right? So it was kind of one of one of those moments where it's like, maybe, maybe we've, you know... Uh, for lack of a better phrase, jump the shark when it comes to playing 5e. Having so many homebrew rules, we've jumped the shark. It's not 5e anymore. Mm -hmm. So. And then, in creation, I will say, going through the, um, you know, the initial phase of it. Um, and again, to Jason, even though he won't take credit for it, uh, his argument for D20, because I really want to go D6. I am a. I like I like stats. I like to know what I'm gonna roll. Like, I know I want to know my odds. You really are a GURPS player. I am. <laughs> I am. Yes. He, I am. he is a GURPS player, uh, through and through. Uh, yes, we we that was a that was a relatively big discussion for us too. Was what type of system is this going to be? Is this going to be a D10 system, a D20 system, a 3D6 system? Or something else. Which uh, I, I can oh, I can certainly understand that, and you're in relative good company since um, 
Farsight is doing the is doing their own hack of of five E, but they decided to go with um, two D twelve instead of um, D twenty, and that and that that's a whole other that's a whole other can of worms. I'll save for another day, but there's always been some contention when it comes to the bell curve with the D twenty, but. One thing that I was cu one thing that I was curious about is the is one of the big pushes with uh, Mythos, and that's the fact that it is so freeform. You have you have the concept of XP as currency, but you also have the f you also have the fact that everything is spent uh, is based around AP, and there's a couple of things that I'm curious on that one. What gave you the idea to do that? And two, how how do you plan on um, accounting for that when it comes to think when it comes to things like encounters? So, the AP system came about. I think is, I think we kind of looked at maybe some BattleTech, Pathfinder, D and D. Uh, you know, kind of like the feats, also in GURPS, where you're buying. Um, your advantages, disadvantages. Mm -hmm. um, if I remember, and, it was BattleTech. Someone had well, mentioned something about BattleTech, and you just you dove in to BattleTech. We're reading first edition BattleTech, second edition BattleTech, and you're like, "Hey, they have this like currency spending system." I'm, th I'm thinking I really like this. <laughs> are, we, like, are you talking BattleTech or Mech Warrior? Might have been Mech Warrior. Mech Warrior. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mech Warrior. BattleTech yep. is the war, is the skirmish war game. Mech right, Warrior right. was the RPG that was based on that universe. Yes, yeah. Mech Warrior. That was it. Um, and previous to this, we had a leveling system, and even that had gone through a few iterations. Because originally we were just like, okay, yep, one to twenty, and then Jimmy was like, why don't we just have like a bring it down for like instead of one to twenty, like just one through five. And I was like, well, that's that's interesting. That's different. Okay, let's let's see how that goes. And then he, and then like I said, he then he, someone had mentioned something about Mech Warrior, and he really dove in. Was like, ooh, ooh, they have this this experience sort of system here. You know, let's let's take a look at that. All right, well, let's check that out. And, so then we just started assigning points to that. I, and I know in your um, unimpression video, I, I know you kind of found rolling stats was a little counterproductive to, to use the AP points so why don't you buy uh, stats and, and it is you can uh, we do have a point buy system so mm -hmm. if you wanted to do AP plus that you can um, what we always joke with and what we found in testing is that given the option of how people want to go ahead and do things they want to roll stats hmm. yeah it, a lot it, of people like to it's it's all dice goblins. They they want to roll dice. So, um, as you mentioned, we do have the you know gritty. Uh, I forgot what it is. Gritty, average, and heroic or epic. Uh, yeah, for the dice. For the dice there, we also have a dice pool that wasn't included there. So we also have a dice pool way to do it. Yeah. Um, we and then we like have the AP we're... costs. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to make sure people we one of the things we've always kind of kept in mind with developing mythos is give people options let them customize the game in certain aspects you know to beyond just character creation because character creation that's its own level of customization but why not make the system itself versatile mm -hmm. uh and we just we balance it yeah so even in just speaking of generating stats it, that's why we have that kind of those power level dynamics because say you have you know one person's like I want to roll stats but another person's like I want to use a dice pool another person's like I want to use point buy mm -hmm. well as long as you use the same level it'll it'll come out balanced mm -hmm. so everybody in the group could do something different for whatever reason you know one person they're used to playing video game RPGs where you assign points to set your stats, right? So there's your there's your point buy. The other person, they just love the clickety clack of dice. Okay, yeah. here you go. Here's your here's your roll die. 
now in in the spirit of that I'd like to talk a, I'd like to ask a few things on archetypes now initially when I initially when I saw when I was looking through the concept I had figured because of the material that I, some of the material that I had at the time that it was that it was going you were gonna have th you're gonna have three archetypes that would fill the warrior rogue mage Trinity and then everything would just bit would just build off from that um, I've sent I've since corrected that issue but how ma how many um, how many base archetypes are you planning for the core book I believe it's six or is it five? six so, six trees? so in our in our full rule book there will be an alchemist the arcanist which is the mage the Myrmidon, which is the fighter the rogue, and then uh, a priest. Mm -hmm. So we'll have those five as our baseline archetypes. And I had also saw that you were that you're planning your own take your own take on the concept of prestige of prestige cl um, classes in the form of paths. And this was one of the things I do distinctly remember bringing up. In my in my unimpressions video on Mythos, and I want I want to pick your brains on this pr particular thing. How are you going to handle multiclassing? <laughs> <laughs> Man, we've had a lot of discussion on this. Um, yep. So I'll so, start, and then Jason. Okay, yeah, go ahead. If you want. So we don't do multiclassing in the traditional sense. Uh, so multiclassing was, you know, as far as I understand it, well, it was you had to dip levels in certain things to get. Certain advantages, yeah, or pay certain to, skills. Yeah, pay to not suck and false choice problems result resulted from that approach. It's it's part, oddly enough, is part of the reason why I liked the feat based multiclassing in fourth edition. Well, so what we decided to do was, I know you mentioned the skill list, like mm -hmm. you said, it's it's yeah, you know, it's it's beautiful, but it's also a burden. So we opened the skill list, so. If you wanted to be a fighter, but you wanted to have the thief skills, you can take those. You don't have to jump into thief to do it. You get your advantages of the archetype. Right? You don't get the advantages of the rogue. Mm -hmm. But you can take all the skills. Now, if you wanted to even go a step further than that, this will tie in the paths. All the paths are universal. So anybody can take them. So now if you wanted to say, I want the fighter archetype, I want the thief skills, and I want to be an assassin, I can take that path. Mm -hmm. So that is how we worked around multiclassing. And I know you had also mentioned um, it could get pretty crazy if you allow the multiples. So we do limit paths to two and if you do take two your initial path if you want to increase levels of that all the AP costs then double mm -hmm. and there has to be a game we, we obviously we say this but it's up to the GM we would like to see an in game reason why right I never as a GM or even as a player liked it when somebody would just say well I'm going to go do this well, well, dude, we're in the middle of a forest. How are you going to go do it? Well, I'm just going to go do it. And the GM never stopped him. There was no in-game reason why. I always found that a little a little odd. So we we wanted to also put in, and hopefully you know, it sticks, the caveat of there has to be a reason why you're switching your path. Mm -hmm. But to your to your thing about multiclassing, no, you're you, in this system. If you go fighter, remember <laughs> Uh, yeah. You can't go into rogue. You can't go into wizard. However, with the talents, you can pick and choose. Mm -hmm. So everyone can cast magic. Everyone can do divine if they want. You can buy those. Yeah, that's so what. There's I, nothing stopping you. That's what I. Th when I was going through it, the assessment that I had in my notes was anybody can feasibly cast spells, but the Arcanist is going to be better at casting than anybody else. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Spot yes. on. Yep. Same, same with the priest. Um, anybody can take. It, it's not in the beginner's guide, but it is in the the core rule book. Anybody can gain 
divine favor from a chosen god that they venerate. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to be able to do everything that a dedicated priest will do. Which, um, speaking on that, um, a lot of ge- a lot of with a lot of games, and this is this is a issue that I have with not just with D and D, but a lot of fantasy games. Period that fall into this trap of having arca- essentially arcane and divine magic be even the, even if there's different descriptors or different things outside of it when it comes to actually you when it comes to actually using it it's lar- it's largely the same and what i'd be what i'm curious about is how how divine favor works and how you distinguish the casting from an arcanist versus the casting from a priest so, <laughs> magic we use. Or, I got to brush up on this one. So, I've been doing a lot more other than game mechanics. So, magic is more um, like chaos, which is why you're going to be rolling the dice mm-hmm. uh, because it's just it's magic. It's just out in the world. Yeah. Divine favor, and, and you have a spell pool. Let me go ahead and break this down for everyone there. So, you get a spell pool. Mm-hmm. And then you have your your spells, and with that spells, you choose on how much or how little you want to go ahead and cast and choose. And like you said, they're better at it, so they can empower spells and do different things with the spells. Um, so that's one mechanic they can use. Priests, oh, and their spell pool regenerates X amount of points per day. Mm-hmm. So you can spend it, you're just not going to get it all back. It's not like spell slots where you just get those back the next day. Yeah. With divine. Uh, divine, we actually have it broken down into three levels. Um, you have your general realm powers. So anybody who is a uh, priest or a war priest can choose from those. Mm-hmm. You have your realms. We have nine realms. Um, it didn't work out that way from Norse mythology. It just, it just happened to be nine. Uh, you can choose from those nine realms or the realm that you're in. You can choose powers from that. And then you have God-specific uh, powers. Just like a priest, you do have a pool. However, that pool is refreshed every day. Mm-hmm. And you can swap in and out. So you can choose different powers each day. And they do a set number of damage. Yeah, so that's that I think it was is the biggest difference between the arcane and the divine. So with an arcane spellcaster, right, you have your spell save or your to hit roll, and then you roll dice for damage for the priest. They make a communion check where they actually communicate to their god what it is they're trying to do, what try what power they're trying to channel their divine energy through. They have to make that, and then if they succeed, the effect just happens. It does a specific amount of damage. They don't roll for damage. It's a static number. Um, and what we've kind of found is that uh, people like having if feel or, or not i shouldn't say feel different but be different they they like the fact that hey divine is actually its own thing arcane is its own thing there's not cross pollination and we take that even a step further where in the game we say that if you have something that is a uh anti magic shield well that affects your arcane magic but it has no effect on divine power and same thing with divine power you, if you have something that nullifies divine power, uh, that has no effect on arcane magic. So they are separate forces. Yeah, and that's that's something I appreciate because Lord Lord knows I've Lord knows I've seen that particular problem way too way too often. Um, now, with that with that in mind, I'm ge- I'm guessing that when it comes to paths, the main the main thing that it, the main um, concern is ha- is having the proper qualifications for it. Um, however, there's a potential problem that can happen when it comes to quali- when it comes to qualifications, and that is when someone's building a character not be- not because of the nat- of the natural series of choices, but because they're trying to build to get something. Um, this is this is partially related to the dip class thing we mentioned um, earlier when talking about multi-classing. So, I'm 
do you do you guys plan on having it where it's re I won't say easy but re but relatively accept accessible to get to get into most paths so we're going to take it a step further there are no requirements to, for a path right it's just you and again you don't even have to take it right that's the i, I want to make that very clear uh, this is something that's completely optional for the players right they do not have to go down uh they don't have to take a path mm -hmm. um, but there's no qualifying for it it's not like a prestige class where you have to be x y and z it's I think the way we looked at paths, I know you say you look at them as a prestige class. I think we looked at them as a profession. A prof and yeah. that actually, and that actually came from um, my hang up um, with the assassin. Right, I was like, well, if you think about it, the root of an assassin, it's just someone who's well skilled in the art of killing. And it's a set of skills, right, to Liam Neeson, right? I got a particular set of skills. Mm -hmm. You got a particular set of skills. You're no different than a carpenter or a cobbler or a farmer. You have a set of skills. You just happen to kill people with yours. Yeah, I, I, um... always, I always used to hate, like, why can't a mage be an assassin, right? Why can't he learn those skills? Why can't a fighter learn those skills? So when we made pass, we just made them universal. Anybody could take them. There's no qualification, and it, think of it more like a profession than a subclass. And uh, right, it's funny you mention that because I do remember in one of my settings, um, coming up with a character archetype that we called the censor. The censor, it is essential, essentially, for the for the magic for the magic society, equal parts hitman or. And bounty hunter, specifically f targeting magic users, because the approach w the approach was that anybody who anybody who is who te who has mage as their profession has to agree to a set of rules that are referred to as the cipher. And within the cipher, there are certain pe there are certain avenues of magic that are either outright are either outright banned or you can only take them if you have strict supervision. Um, and this is two two ones among them that are that are in, that are on the ban list is any form of blood magic and any form of necromancy. Um, and if you get caught do if you if you get caught doing it, then a censor is gonna is going to be called upon to take you out. Ideally, they'd want to keep. They'd want to capture you alive, but if worse comes to worse, they are they are a mage specifically trained in killing mages. Oh. I, I, I get it, and I'm on board, and I love it. I think I think that's great. And yeah, that's too, that, that sounds pretty cool. Well, the one of the core rules that I had with it is that instead of being able to cast a bunch of different spells, they have they're able to generate certain certain melee and ranged weapons that don't physically harm but they do really fuck with with uh, mages ability to connect to magic in gameplay terms they can essentially burn out spell slots with the, with their attacks um, if i was if i was using if i if i was using mythis in this case they'd be able to they would they would be able to do essentially um essentially spell essentially directly damage your own spell points. <laughs> so I we we actually have a I think it's a is it a venerator, Jason? Yeah, so the one of the paths that will be in the full game is called the Path of the Venator and there are, there are mage there are our version of mage hunters. Mm -hmm. Um and so one of the things that they kind of get is essentially something kind of similar where they essentially can um, do, th you know, it's they get all different abilities based on tracking uh, people with magic, detecting people with magic, resisting magic. Uh, but also, you know, uh, one of the things is uh, we have uh, like dispersing spells, being able to like parry them out of the way, reflect them back at the caster, purging uh, mana 
So that way, it does something similar to what you said. It kind of burns the magic out of them. They they lose uh, their mana, so it makes it harder or even sometimes impossible for them to cast spells. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually took that a step further. I didn't mean to interject. We actually have mana nullification, where if you wanted to completely nullify mages, there's talents that can nullify it. Yep. Also, I'm, so, I'm not I'm not saying that that one of my players played a sensor and used the dead or alive you're coming with me line from RoboCop, but I'm not I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and say that they didn't either. That's that's pretty good. That um, is, that is pretty good. Plus, in in that whole in what you mentioned about the about the assassin and the like, um, a while back. On the on the channel, we did a deep dive into Veil of the Void, and what's relevant for this is one of the uh, one of the builds that you could do was a bounty hunter, and one of the key features that they have is that they is that whenever they're in a settle whenever they're in a settlement, they have a they are they they are awarded by the GM a list of bounties that they can collect in that area. Ah. Uh, because well, because well, for for one, it's a good way to introduce some char some character drama. If say, if say a NPC that's important to the quest just happens to have a price on their head, and b and b, if you're gonna if you're going to be if you're gonna be called a bounty hunter, you should probably be doing some bounty hunting. I agree. Yeah, I so agree wholeheartedly on that one. That's again. That's one of the things. Uh, in just going back to the pads real quick. Again, like Jimmy said, we don't have any requirements in terms of, you know, oh, you need to have a dex of thirteen, or you need to have this talent or this skill. Everything with us is very story driven. We're, we are, while while combat is a focus of the game, RPG is the main or the the first part of RPG is R role playing. You know, the role. So all of our stuff, like Jimmy kind of mentioned earlier, is if you want to be an assassin, either you need to take it at character creation and work it into your backstory, or you need to have something happen in game where you meet assassins or find an assassin's guild and seek to enter it. Like there has to be something in game that lets you access that path. Uh, you can't just be like, you know what? Our characters, none of the characters in our party and in this campaign have ever met a mage hunter. But you know what? I think that's what I want to do. Cool. I just gained, you know, this mana nullification power or this spell reflection power. No, because it, it makes no sense. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> as somebody, as somebody who, who um, very who very much crusades for Mar for Marshall archetypes and as ver is very much against the idea of the fighter being Babby's first character. Um, it did make my eyes light. I wasn't able to cover it because it because it was in it wasn't in the ma it was in a work in progress document. But I do appreciate the presence of fighting styles. And I'd like to pick your guys' brains on what fighting styles are, are intended to be and what as far as the fan, the um, role playing fantasy of it, and how you guys are going to be utilizing fighting styles. Oh, Jason, if you don't mind, I'll take this. Yeah, no, that that's all Jimmy right there. <laughs> so that actually came about uh, my background in martial arts, mm -hmm. and not taking taekwondo, uh, combat submission wrestling, Thai boxing, uh, MMA. So when we decided to kind of focus on uh, combat, you know, at that point, as Jason alluded to earlier, the death of a thousand cuts. Even when I ran D and D or Pathfinder or GURPS, I wanted combat to be a business decision for the party. It should never be looked upon lightly, and you should you should really should expect. Or you should go in thinking, even though it's not fun, but my character can die. But if all you ever get to do is just swing a sword, that's just no fun. 
that's just no fun at all. And that's the only thing you get to go do with it. And in all my time in martial arts, uh, especially with the Kali of Screamo with the short swords uh, and the staff and seeing that art, I wanted to put that into a D20 system. Uh, so we actually have 19 uh, fighting styles. Um, we have single weapon or shield, pole arm art. Um, <laughs> we had one of our writers just inadvertently say, oh, when he was writing, uh, helping us out with the world book, he put in um, monks for dwarves. So I had to create the iron monks of the anvil, short sword, two-handed sword. Uh, we have an orc style that's very uh, panacration mm -hmm. heavy, uh, fencing. So you actually have cloak, and then you also have dagger and mangouche. Uh, elves have a style. Um, I actually have another style that we use for um, the archipelagos in the south. It's based off the Hawaiian bone breaking art uh, mm -hmm. called the uh, Ku Empty Hand. Mm -hmm. Staff, we have an archer. We have the Way of the Dragon, which would kind of be your traditional monk martial artist. You have a spider hunter, which is for the north. Dagger and knife fighting. Again, uh, another writer made this, you know, writers, God bless them. Sometimes I hate them. Uh, he put in this whole thing about these this these sword saints and how they could do this. You know, he just basically narrated what they could do. So I had to create a style. So we have a sword saint style. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then we have a spear and shield fighting style. <laughs> and each of them, although they some things do overlap because there's only so much you can do with two hands and two feet, two knees, two elbows, mm -hmm. and a headbutt. But they all allow fighters, if you wanted to, or anybody, because again, just like Paz, anybody can take a fighting style. Mm -hmm. And there's no qualification. There's no, you have to, there's no prerequisites. You can just take it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you wanted to do other things in combat, you can. Um, so again, it just enhances. It just enhances the fighting style, right? I, um, I think one of our uh, big things that we do see now in playtest, even today, is the pole arms. Um, so just to give your listeners a little more history, myth is just isn't the system. It's also the world that we created, and we actually created the world before the system. Uh, and when we were doing this, we uh, were trying to figure out movement because we wanted pole arms not to just be a reskinned two-handed sword. Because in every system, it's just, a, it, in my opinion, from what I've seen, it's just a reskinned two-handed sword. Except you can brace, I think was one of the things you could do with it. Possibly trip. Mm -hmm. um, so we took that a step further. We have sweeps, trips, hooks, uh, <clears throat> spinning strikes, a, uh, disarming feints, quick strikes, targeted attacks, uh, different ways to parry weapons. So we really wanted, if you chose to take a weapon, which fighters do. I mean, when you, people choose to take a fighter, they usually have something in mind that they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we really wanted to give, whenever they made that choice, that fighter feel really special for taking that weapon if that's what he really wanted to focus on. So you can take that fighting style along with Weapon Master, <clears throat> Enhanced Parry that we have in there, and you can really, really start showing off what a quote-unquote fighter can do. Yeah. And, and the great thing is where the fighter really excels is a lot of the combat maneuvers and some of the techniques for the fighting styles they cost stamina to use. Well, we have built into the fighter archetype, you know, cost half stamina to do these things. Or if there is one that doesn't have a stamina cost, you get an innate plus two to it. So again, it's that thing where, yes, anybody can take a fighting style. Fighters are going to be the best at it. You know, except for unless maybe there's... We do have some fighting styles that are more based around uh, empty hand martial arts, which those are a little bit more designed for monks which we hope to put in soon yeah uh, maybe not with the core book but you know there's there's a jo there's a joke that I've of I've often made when it comes to when it comes to um when it comes to the when it comes to the concept of a monk class 
is the f is um you're you're prof you guys have probably seen the matrix so when it, but whenever whenever i hear Keanu Reeves doing the line of i know kung fu i'm always i'm always thinking okay which one seriously which <laughs> seriously which one there's like 1500 versions of yep. kung fu and when you look at a lot of monk classes obviously the, obviously the gimmick is them being for those who want to get their mar their unarmed martial arts fix but the problem is the there's this there's this almost one size fits all attitude when it comes to that and even if, even if you don't account for um stri striking centric styles and grappling centric styles there's a but there's that's still a huge variety that you're dealing with um and i'm I'm of the opinion that somebody who somebody who's fighting somebody who's fighting style is supposed to supposed to be reminiscent of um, Muay Thai shouldn't be shouldn't have this shouldn't exactly have the same action pool as somebody whose fighting style is say, is say um is say capoeira. I know I mis I know I mispronounced it, but in my defense, I'm Minnesotan. <laughs> So I don't know if I would say a st same pool, but you shouldn't have the same moves. Mm -hmm. Moves, right? Yeah. So same techniques. Cause, yeah, because a Thai fighter, you're not going to see move like a Kapoweya fighter, right? No. You're not going to have. So right off the bat, you're not going to have acrobatics in Muay Thai. You're going to have acrobatics in Kapoweya. Mm -hmm. So we did try to. Let me, let, me, let me back up. What I wanted to do with the bunk was not just have a basically an unarmed fighter that ran around with no armor and did multiple attacks. I, I that, that to me is boring. Uh, so with what we were looking at, and we're still kind of tweaking it a little bit, but I think we pretty much got it down. But everything that we've done here, what I named up the fighting styles, we also have um, SS-centric moves that can only be done by the martial artist. And where that comes from was if you go back to, again, I'm going to go reference to UFC. If you look at the very beginnings of UFC, because anybody can take martial arts. Right? Anybody can take martial arts. So when you looked at like UFC 1, it was Joe Smith, air conditioner repairman, black belt in Taekwondo versus Hoist Gracie, whose only job was to go in there and tap you out. Joe Smith knew martial arts. But he was not really a true martial artist. That was not his profession. So we we really wanted to take the martial artist, although everybody could take him, but really again focus the martial artist on doing what the martial artist does best. Yep. Fighting with either weapons or their hands. Or a combination of both. Right, with um, with their style. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and we, and that, that's where you really want to lay the focus. You're not going to get the fluff and say, oh, well, I'm wearing robes, so now I get this ridiculous armor class. No, you wear armor like everybody else. You get to do that. This is where, this is where you excel, right? So that's where we kind of took that off. It's going to be the same pool, but it's not going to be the same moves. And again, there's only so many different things, uh, so many different ways you could fight with two arms and two legs. Mm -hmm. And what, given given what you said, it's it sounds like, like what what I mentioned with the, what I mentioned earlier with the Arcanist. That's some that's something that is going to apply to a lot of the classes. I.e., things things like things like fight things like fighting with weapons. Any anybody can do. Anybody can theoretically do. But the Mermidian is going to be the be is going to be better at it. Yes, and the other thing I think you can appreciate being that you like fighters was kind of harping back to the uh, harking back to the point system. Mm -hmm. When you build, when, when you give the AP and you allow people to kind of build what they want, it, again, in my experience, most campaigns don't make it to 15th and 20th level. Yeah, they, they really don't get to do it. So the cool stuff, the really stuff that the cool kids get you never really get to use, or it's very rare that you get to use it as a player. So when we started kind of breaking it down, depending on how many AP points you start out with, 
and how you choose to um, run your game. If you want to be a um, if you want to be a complete special specialized fighter in only doing criticals, you know, for fifty AP points, you can start off doing criticals at seventeen to twenty. Mm-hmm. So how you build, so it, it allows you to again do what you want the way you want to do it, and I think that was one of the things on the martial classes. The other thing too is the shield. Uh, we spent a lot of time on shields. Uh, I know in, in most systems they just kind of give you an AC bump because there's really not. A, I mean, they do. You, I think you're allowed to shove. Um, you can do a shove, and it gives you an AC bump. Here, we really made shields a very important part. Historically, they were. Historically, they were. They, they're still used today. I mean, let's let's not forget they're still used today. Um, very important in in combat in general. Uh, so, like you had said, um, it adds to your block. Well, also with that block, fighters um, can block spells minus you know, area of attacks, but even then they can use hide and gain cover from that. So, no longer are mages safe by saying, oh, I'm just going to sit back and throw fireballs, or I'm going to sit back and go do the... No, no, no. That can now be blocked if, by a fighter with a shield, and he's rushing. I mean, he's going to be closing the distance. So to sit back and say oh I'm a mage and this is what I get to do you run somebody who actually could really take the time to really build a fighter I it's it's gonna it's gonna be a great fight mm-hmm. now with that in, with that in mind I'm not I'm, in some of the in some of the comments for that in that unimpressions video I saw a few people referencing the dark eye was the Dark Eye a, ga- a game that either of you dipped into at any at any point? I never heard of it until I saw your comments. <laughs> yeah, same same here. Uh, I just sat there and was like, "Is this a Lord of the Rings reference or something that maybe I'm missing?" Uh. So I guess the short answer to that is no. No. <laughs> and for the for the record, the Dark Eye or Das Schwarz Anga. Oh, that's really bad German. Um, it start. The 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 long and short the long and short of the dark eye is um, TSR had wor- TSR had was working with a company to produce a German version of D and D until they bu- until they back until TSR backed out said company was like fine we'll make our own D and D with blackjack and hookers all and, right <laughs> and, okay <laughs> and while the well from what I've been told because I haven't been able to see the early editions because I don't speak German um, the early editions were very close to d and d but as it's evolved with time it that hasn't been the case as much um but I can definitely I can definitely see where people would come to that especially when it comes to how you handle defense which I find very interesting since in this system you do not have any static defenses. Everything's either a block, a dodge, or a parry that you have to actively roll for. Yes. Or a saving it, throw. <laughs> or a saving throw, yes. We still have saving throws. Um, yeah. Well, you're rolling for saving throws anyways, so... That's <laughs> true. That is true. Uh, I, I think that, again, that comes from... We have we have one friend that we, 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 we play with, um, we game with, and he rolls horribly. He's, he's just it's just it's just bad. It's almost comical. How bad this guy rolls. But is, um, are we ta- are we talking he's he has to deal with XCOM level RNG? Yes. Yes. If if it was Star Trek, he's definitely a red shirt kind of guy. Um yeah. uh, he, so, he's Will Wheaton levels of rolling bad. <laughs> ouch. Yeah. yeah, yeah it bad. it is that bad. So when we introduce this to him. And because it is a, it's essentially a challenge system, right? I roll, you roll, I put my bonuses together, you put your bonuses together, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, We found a lot of times, if you built your character correctly, and Jeff actually did very well in in doing that, uh, even if he rolled low, he still either dodged, blocked, or parried. 
so all of a sudden this guy who was like, oh my god, I can never make a saving throw, was suddenly like, oh man, I rolled a four, but what'd you get? I got that. Well, you know what? I rolled a five, but my attack was you know, only plus three, so your nine actually beat my eight, so there you go. Mm-hmm. So it... All of a sudden now, and everybody is now engaged too, because now everybody wants to see what you roll. Because when you're behind the screen and you're the GM and you're rolling against armor class, nobody sees what you nobody nobody sees what you're rolling. And a lot of times you're fudging the roll anyway because you don't want to kill off your party party, right? Your party dies multiple times and nobody even knows it. Uh, but here, everybody is looking to see what happens. So we found the level of engagement, and we were very. I think when we first introduced it, it wasn't a very big. Um, we we felt it was going to go over like a lead balloon. Yeah, right. A lot of people were kind of against it. Um, we tried it out with uh, our our group, and then we started taking it out to cons. And then um, last year we went to Southern Fried Gaming in Atlanta, and uh, we were doing it. The people were getting into it. Like it was it was crazy for us to watch these guys because everyone was invested. And what that player was going to do, like when it was rolling, and it was a, and it was because it's really you versus the GM, and people can really get behind that. So we found that to be a, a interesting thing. And yes, dodge, block, and parry. That's why we put it in there. We found that it keeps it keeps people engaged, and I, people seem to like it. Mm-hmm. And i I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that because when it comes to when it comes to st- static defense, the the issue with it is that, as you mentioned, the GM's behind a screen, and people aren't and people aren't going to be. If he ends up rolling well or, or the like, there's unless you have unless you have some reaction options, which is an assumption you can't you shouldn't be making. Um, there's nothing they can, there's nothing they can do. But here, there's at le- there's at least something that they can try to do, even if it's not a guarantee. Oh, and that bring that brings me to one to one thing that I had that I had mentioned uh, in the unimpressions, and I'm I'm curious if you guys have taken this under consideration. So I had I had me- I had mentioned uh, I had mentioned the issue of analysis paralysis. Because, as, as, and that's, it's, and because of the fact that you guys are going so freeform, that kind of thing is inevitable. And I'm not, so, I'm not saying pare down the skills or anything like that. That's the complete opposite of what I'd want to see. But, in that video, I had given a suggestion for a package system. Um, the Shadowrun Runner, the sh- Runner's Toolkit and Shadowrun did did something similar of these um, suggested packages for that had a certain amount of um, karma cost that could that could be utilized to help get help get the ball ro- help get the ball rolling or establish a framework. Um, I had referenced Anima's um, combat modules as another example. Is the idea of do of doing those sort of skill or Skill or proficiency packages, something you guys have considered? I'll let you take that one, Jason. Yeah, so we actually have two ways in which we're dealing with, as you said, the analysis paralysis. So the first one, in talking about your your package, we do have something similar. Mm -hmm. What we decided, and this was something we actually decided to do before uh, we sent you the material, and and again, it's not in the beginner's guide because beginner's guide is very pared down already from what's in the full rule book but um in the full rule book in each archetype it gives examples of types of characters that you can build and what we recommend for talents skills weapon options or spells things like that so as an example bards bards are something you can build in very different ways you i've seen bards that are you know you're they're your D magic bard hey i cast spells or sometimes they're more like Dragon Age, where they're more spy, more roguish. So in our system, we actually have bards in there twice. We have one, uh, or three times actually. We have uh, one that is just, it's under the fighter, 
and it's a fighter based bard and it's your person who's the musician but knows how to defend himself then you have the rogue where that's your more spy based bard and then we have under the arcanus yep. which is your more magic based bard Mm-hmm. And we've done that for a lot of things, and even thing, uh, even the standard classes where you know we don't have things like barbarians and rangers, we actually have under the fighter. Here's how you can build a barbarian. Here's what you take for talents. Here's how you take this, 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 and it's and it's recommendations. It's not anything that's like you have to take this and this and this. It's you know we recommend these three talents. We recommend these five skills. We recommend one of these fighting styles, and we still keep. Uh, still keep it where it's the player's choice. We don't. One of the things we were very big on in the system is player choice and not pigeonholing them into something specific. Let mm-hmm. them make the character that they want to make. So that's the first way we handle that. The second is that we actually, in terms of the wide breadth of rules and skills and things like that, we have both advanced and simplified versions of various rule sets. So one of the things you can do is, as a group, if you decide, hey, you know what, we're just starting out, we're not 100% sure on the rules, we're going to take this simplified rule on how damage is done. So there's no damage multipliers, it's just straight damage. Mm -hmm. Now, with... With that in mind, as I as I understand it, you guys are splitting it into. You guys are doing three and, um, on how we use uh, advanced version. That sorry. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know if. Sorry, I didn't know. I didn't know if you had you had um fin- you had finished your uh, thought. Um. Yeah. No. I was just saying we have advanced and simplified versions of rules to help players at different play levels whether they're new to rpgs we have simplified rules to help make things easier for them Mm -hmm. and then as that group gets more experienced with the system they could say hey let's start using these advanced rules or hey let's start a new campaign and use these advanced rules and then we you can have other people who they've been playing rpgs for 30 years and they're like we really want crunchy rules well here's your advanced rules that are a little bit more crunchy here you go all right now as i understand it you guys are doing three books um a a um co- I think the the core book the wor- the world guide and the um referees guide for le- and um what do creature you guys compendium. yeah creature compendium I think yeah I think I I think old habits died hard on that front um <laughs> what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window. If it's successful, so uh, we've we've done a lot of this. The core book's pretty much done, minus layout. I mean, everything is written for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for your audience, the Kickstarter goal is twelve thousand dollars for the three books. Um, that's what we have figured for art, layout, uh, editing, um, those type of things. Um, our window, man, it's tough. And I want to be as transparent as possible. Even though they do say the supply chain is going to be up and running and everything's going to be good uh, by next year, we're giving a date of August 2023 for all three books. Um, We have found that we're able to do a lot of the stuff here in the United States. uh, Comparable, you know, whether you call it a blessing or a curse because of shipping prices coming from overseas. It just really isn't as cost effective. It's actually just as cost effective to do it here in the states if you can get with a good printer. Uh, we were fortunate enough to find uh, two printers we could partner with uh, that actually one has an overseas presence to help with shipping uh, overseas. Um, but we would like to see a. We're giving ourselves a year, right? I, in my job, it's always you know under promise, over deliver. Mm-hmm. If we could get it out sooner we'll make the announcement but with the way that we see things going uh, I, I would rather have a little bit of little bit of leeway in there a little bit of wiggle room because we do have a lot of the creatures already done um, the world book is it has to go through another second round of editing and we just need the maps so I mean that's 60 to 70% completed and our map guy is 
going and working on them now. He's super excited about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a lot of a lot of that already in place. So if we we are able to have a good funding and have a good showing um, and get this done, I would like to see it before a year, but I would say at least a year, just mm-hmm. to be on the safe side. All right. Mm-hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to it, as well as well as looking forward to the to the launch of the to the launch of the um, Kickstarter next Thursday at the time of this recording. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you guys see fit to return, the door is always open, as I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, listen, we appreciate you taking the time out to go ahead and give us the opportunity and the forum to go ahead and speak about, you know, our game is something that we're very passionate about. And, uh, you know, don't, you don't have to wait on us, right? If you want to, <laughs> if you want to bring us back in uh, and chat and, you know, see how things are going, uh, please feel free to reach out. We will, we will make time. Yep, absolutely. And um, for anybody who is listening and is interested in that kickstarter uh like i said it's going off on the 15th of this month uh we actually have for the first 72 hours where we're going to be at southern fried gaming expo uh that's going to be our launch event we're going to have early adopter pricing so that's a good time to jump in and all the stuff that we're giving out is like pledge rewards and stuff we made very sure that they were going to be useful things for the game so we have things like maps combat cards uh 3D miniatures and adventures. So we were are really taking the time to plan it, do it right, make it worth your wild. So please give us a consider on that front. Mm-hmm. And I will say this: the maps are not printed on paper because I, for one, hate maps that rip. You get them for a few years and they rip. These were actually done on uh, matte canvas or vinyl, uh, matte vinyl, um, and they are slick and they will not rip. Yep. So I just want people to understand that this isn't a, you know, you do that and it's printed on 20 cent poster paper. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and uh, with the, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!